All right, 20 years ago, there was a uh, groundbreaking new TV show called 24. Anyone remember watching 24 when that came on? Uh, um, uh, I hadn't heard anything about it. I was just flipping through the channels like I always do, and all of a sudden, this was back before they had streaming. You just had to watch whatever was on TV when it was on. Uh, you even had to watch commercials. It was just, that's the way it was back then. But what drew me in was, all of a sudden, on, on my TV, there were three screens at the same time showing things that were all happening at the, at the same, simultaneously what was happening in real time. It had this little digital clock uh, counting off, which added to all the suspense and drama. So instead of looking at just one part of a story, you could look at the whole story at one time. So it was very, very interesting technique, uh, very effective storytelling, and it's one that, uh, that Mark uses as well in the Gospel of Mark. I'll, I'll explain in just a minute here. So for those of us, those of you who may be joining us, joining us now, we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark. Uh, as Mark tells the story of Jesus, by Jesus' words and actions as inaugurating this kingdom of God, a way of life um, that marked by, um, by the healing of brokenness, uh, restoring people into community. And, and because of that, huge crowds have gathered around Jesus uh, because they recognize there's something, something going on. They don't understand exactly what yet, but they know this is something important. Last week, because the crowd's been pressing in on him so much, he, they, he gets away, takes a, a, a break, goes across the lake to the Gentile side of the, of the, of the country where, uh, where no one knows him, um, uh, and then ends up coming back uh, across today. Now, typically, when Mark tells his stories, he's very, very succinct. He's sparse with words, very direct, and and to the point. Uh, he packs his accounts in. He likes to use the word immediately, and then he moves on to the next encounter. But today's reading is uncharacteristic. All of a sudden, he slows down. And he, he tells a story, the same, uh, Mark and Luke tell the same story, but they tell it much briefer than Mark does. And say, well, wait a second, that doesn't happen anywhere else in the Gospels, that Mark spends more time with the story than anyone else does. Uh, and so part of me says, well, what's going on here? Uh, he could have just told one story and then told the next story. That's what he does all the way through his Gospel. Now, all of a sudden, he tells two stories at exactly the same time, intertwines them together. So why, why would you do that? Why not just tell one story, then tell the next story? Well, you do it to show how two seemingly unconnected events are, are very much connected by telling them at the same time. So let's listen to the story, and then we can talk about it a little bit. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came. He said, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians, had spent all that she had, and was no better. Rather, she grew worse. She had heard about Jesus. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, the hemorrhaging start, stopped. She felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? The disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came back from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher 
any further. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Now he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came into the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people wailing and weeping loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why do you make such a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. He put them all outside. He took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand. He said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. Immediately, the little girl got up, began to walk about where she was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know of this and told them to give her something to eat. Isn't that a great story? I just love how he puts those together. Two intertwining stories of healing that reminds us how universal our need for healing is. It's something that affects everyone, rich and poor alike. I mean, seemingly different settings here, right? You've, you've got, on the one hand, you've got Jairus, this prominent, respected leader of the synagogue, a real somebody in Capernaum. And you have an unnamed woman, most likely a beggar because she's used all of her resources to try to find healing from physicians and was unable to. Two very different people, but their need is the same. They need healing in their lives. One had a daughter, in spite of the best care that money could buy, she was dying much too young. The other one was a daughter. And that's what Jesus called her, called her daughter. After years of unanswered prayer, at the end of her rope, barely hanging on. For both of them, the enemy was fear. For one, the fear of the death of a child who was just beginning their life, uh, holding all their hopes and dreams of the parents. The other was the fear of a woman who would be alone. She had a condition that made her unclean, and anyone she touched would be unclean. It's a lonely way to live. But for both, new life was found in their faith. Now when we we talk about faith here. We're not talking about belief in certain tenets of a, of a religion. When we talk about faith here, we're talking about faith at its most basic level, which is trust. Trusting in something. Trusting in someone. Um, it wasn't in an increased amount of faith or having a better articulated prayer that resulted in the healing, right? It wasn't that God wasn't aware of their needs before and couldn't have done something before they even asked. I, 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 don't, I don't really understand why some prayers get answered and some don't, but it's clear that it was faith, this trust, which was at the center of the healing in their lives. Mark uses an a, a interesting word. Um, sometimes we translate it as being made well. Sometimes the word we translate it as being saved. Uh, but he uses the same word for both the little girl and the woman. Whether it was a resurrection from death or whether it was the healing of a chronic illness, they were both saved, trusting God to make things right. Now we all face fears, right? Um, some of them are reasonable. There are scary things out there. Some of them are, are manufactured by those who would want to have power over us. I mean, dictators have long known this. You want to unite people, have them support you, you give them a condom enemy that you can save them from. So uh, there's all kinds of fears that, are, that, are, uh, that surround us. But whatever, whatever the source of the fear is, the remedy is the same. It's trust. Trusting uh, in someone who is able to make a difference. Faith in this one who loves us no matter what. There's a passage from the prophet Isaiah that, that really 
expresses this beautifully. Uh, it's Isaiah uh, 12, chapter two. It says, surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. That verse makes me uh, think about Gene Meyer a little bit. I've been thinking a lot about Gene uh, this week. I met with the family the other day just to try to get the plans put together uh, for the service. The funeral's going to be on Saturday here. Um, for those of you who are new, Gene was one of the charter members uh, of, of Joy here. I was looking at some of the records and I saw where uh, out of the first 10 years of the congregation, he was president for six of those, right? So... Um, Gene was one of those, those guys that I, I loved to, to visit with. You know, the last couple of years, it's been hard. He hasn't, uh, and especially with Dorothy's health was declining, it made it harder and harder to come and to be with us, which just, just broke his heart to not be able to, uh, to, to be here uh, with us. But when I would go uh, and visit or, or take communion to him, I, it's one of those situations where I would always end up feeling uplifted by the experience that who is ministering to who here, <laughs> you know, that I went to be with him but realized this, uh, this deep, deep abiding faith uh, is such an incredible thing when we uh, encounter that. He had such a love uh, for this congregation, but he had an even greater love for his Lord in whose arms he now rests. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength, my might. He has become my salvation. Amen. We were, had trouble with the family, trying, come on, Joan, trying to figure out uh, what hymns to sing because, you know, we said, well, what hymns should we sing? And they said, well, all of them. <laughs> uh, I said, well, we'll have to narrow, narrow it down a little bit. Um, and so uh, one of them that didn't make the cut uh, is Amazing Grace because there are so many other great ones. So I said, well, we'll sing it this Sunday. You know, and Gene can sing, sing with us and he'll know that we're singing it here as well. So powerful, powerful hymn of God's presence with us, Amazing Grace. Let's